What's up, Night Owls? I just finished Unicorn Overlord, and now I want to talk about it. This year has started off strong with the game releases. We had Infinite Wealth, Persona 3 Reload, Helldivers, Pal World, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, and with that being said, I don't want people sleeping on Unicorn Overlord. So that's why I'm here to tell you this game is an absolute gem. It's available on the Switch and the PS5. I played it on the PS5. And as far as I know, I found a news article that confirmed this. It is not coming to the PC, has no intention of ever coming to the PC, which is lame. There is a demo available, which to be frank, will probably serve you better than this review, but I still want to talk about it. So let's get into it. Unicorn Overlord's primary gameplay is moving groups of units around a map to initiate battles with other groups. Battles take place automatically, which came as a surprise to me when I first played the game. I thought based off of the trailers that the gameplay would be more like Darkest Dungeon or Pokemon, where you have the ability to select which moves to use in a turn-based battle. Instead, you set up conditionals for each character and those characters will then execute moves based on your conditional setup. You're effectively programming your team's battle style. I'm not saying that this is a bad thing. I actually fell in love with it pretty quickly, but I did want to address it because I didn't want people to make the same assumptions that I did going into the game. Here's a quick example I put together to illustrate how this works. This mercenary in the front line has the highest initiative stat, meaning he gets to act first. He starts by swinging at the enemy in the front line. Unfortunately, this big tank of a unit holding his front door as a shield soaks that hit like it's nothing you see that the health bar barely moves. But if we make some adjustments to the conditional statements and gear, we can increase our shaman's initiative and have her act first instead. Then if we set up her conditional so that she opens the fight with a defense debuff, our mercenary can now swing for more meaningful damage. This is just a minor example to sort of illustrate how the game is played. And there's plenty more to unpack with this system, especially in the late game where you can really set up complex teams. As for difficulty, you have four options. Story, normal, tactical, expert. There's a fifth option called true cornean, but that unlocks after your first playthrough and it's the hardest difficulty available. I played through the game from start to credits on tactical and I found the game to be not very challenging. To be clear, the game was still very fun, but I rarely felt threatened by the enemy. The biggest challenge will come more from the pressures of the clock as each mission has a time limit. But don't worry because the timer only runs when units are actively moving or doing something. You'll have plenty of time in the pause menu to set things up however you like. The reason I think the game isn't very difficult is because the vast amount of content and side quests offer you money, consumables, and gear upgrades. This is a pretty common situation with massive RPGs like this, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, just something to keep in mind. You see, by doing all the content available to you and experiencing every aspect of the game as they come up, you reach godlike levels of gold and power. Again, I don't feel this is a bad thing. The player always has the option to adjust the difficulty to suit their needs in more ways than one. For example, if you find the game too easy, you can always up the difficulty in the option menu. Or if it's too difficult, you have the option to lower the difficulty or engage in side quests to become more powerful. Also, it's worth noting that because the game has so many options in terms of characters and builds, balance goes right out the window. It's possible to create near unbeatable teams that will steamroll through the main story quest. The progression systems in Unicorn Overlord can be a bit overwhelming at first, so I'll start with the basic ones that all of us are probably familiar with. Gold, XP, gear. Each individual character in your army has their own level, which caps at 50. As the character levels up, they get new abilities that you can add to your character's conditional statements so you can design and engineer your perfect battle scenarios. Characters also have equipment slots so you can slot gear for stat boost or new abilities. This part alone can be incredibly overwhelming as every group can have up to five characters. So you are constantly gearing and designing interactions between several other characters, all of which have their own conditions and gear to manage. It doesn't help that you're constantly being drip fed new characters as you progress through the story and every new character has the potential to overhaul your entire group. Like for example, when I was given the Dragon Rider, which has the ability to fly over walls and mountains, as I mentioned earlier. In some scenarios, they could fly straight to the boss objective and assassinate them while completely ignoring all the fun bottlenecks and traps the developers laid out for you throughout the map. So obviously when I was given one, I had to gear her out and build a team that complemented her weakness to arrows. This meant disassembling other groups and moving gear and characters around. And keep in mind, this all happened when I was given one new unit. This for me is one of the most fun and satisfying parts of the game, being able to make all these small adjustments to each individual and thereby creating a much bigger cohesive picture. But it can get tedious when trying to stay on top of gear upgrades, consumables, and trying to decide who should get what piece of gear and how to spend your gold to maximize your returns. 
And those aren't the only progression systems in place, like the rapport system, which represents the relationship between two characters and not just the main character. Every named character that you recruit can have rapport with some of the other characters that you've recruited or will recruit. For example, Yana the Witch has a long backstory with Joseph and Hodrick, but you only find this out by using these two units together and unlocking cutscene interactions through the rapport system. Every time I got a new unit, I couldn't wait to check who they had rapport with or speculate about who they might have rapport with. Like when I recruited the mage, Osh, I was convinced he would have some kind of rapport with Yana the Witch and they would talk about magical theory or something. Renown and Honor are yet another progression system in place that give you a more broad upgrade. Renown is like your army's rank. You start at rank E and as you gain Renown points, you rank up unlocking new and powerful upgrades which are bought with Honor. To put it another way, Honor is the currency used to purchase upgrades that you unlock with Renown. You gain Renown and Honor by completing quests and turning in items at the towns you visit. Each town has an item bounty board, turning in items grants you honor, and when you complete all of the bounties, you get a large chunk of renown. Renown upgrades allow you to expand your group size to a max of five. You also gain the ability to promote units to a specialized class, and finally, at rank S, you unlock a special boss fight that grants you access to a lightsaber. There is a multiplayer aspect in Unicorn Overlord. At a certain point in the story, around level 25, you will unlock the Colosseum. The Coliseum has offline and online battles. Progressing through offline battles allows you to unlock a new character. For online battles, you build a team specific for your online profile and other players can build teams to fight you. You also have the option to challenge other people's team in order to climb a ladder. Both offline and online grant you a special currency that you can spend at the Coliseum for some of the best gear in the game. As great as this game is, it's not without fault. One of the most frustrating things about it is the inventory management. Having an entire army of units, each requiring their own set of gear, makes scrolling through lines of text to equip and change gear a painful experience. There is a sort feature, but it's not great. There's also a way to flag items as favorite, which would be a strong feature, but it only works on a single instance of an item. You can't, for example, favorite a type of item, like this amulet that gives you more actions. It's a solid piece of gear on literally anyone, so of course it would be a good idea to favorite it. Unfortunately, each individual piece needs to be favorited. Like, why don't these items stack? Another example are these eggs, one of which gives double XP and the other gives double gold. I would have liked to have seen some equipment builds like they have with skills. With skills, you can save loadouts, which allow characters to have multiple builds to use in different situations, but this is not the case with gear. So for example, let's say I'm facing off against a boss and I know that that boss is gonna give me tons of XP and tons of gold. I would have liked to have had a method to switch to my farming build to double the output of the gold and the XP. The story of Unicorn Overlord is pretty straightforward. Big Bad is doing Big Bad stuff to gain more power. It's nothing groundbreaking. They clearly saved all of the good writing for their subplots and character interactions, which are top notch. In the opening cutscene, we're introduced to the queen and her most trusted knight, Joseph. The queen leaves her young son, Elaine, the main character of the story, with the knight, Joseph, before heading off to face the big bad who is about to overthrow the entire kingdom. Joseph escapes with Elaine to a populated island in order to hide. We then fast forward 10 years, and this is the time the main story takes place. Now that the entire kingdom has been taken over and Elaine is an adult, it's time for the Liberation Army to start looking for allies in order to take back the kingdom. At the end of what I consider the tutorial, we learn that the queen was not betrayed by her most trusted knights, at least not all of them. Instead, the villain used magic to mind control them. This is great because it sets up the bosses we face as potential allies. Even the evil characters who are not being mind controlled are still given the chance at redemption by joining our liberation army. It's well done because you get to experience what makes a character unique by facing off against them directly, and after seeing just what it is that makes the character work, they are then added to your roster. As for the map, it's divided into five continents. At the center, or the core, if you will, is Cornea. See what I did there? Cornea is where the capital is and serves as our starting area. Surrounding Cornea are the four kingdoms that you'll be recruiting for the Liberation Army. Drakenhold, the land of dragons. This is where you'll be recruiting wyvern riders and bandits to your army. The reason you find so many bandits and criminals here is because this land is also where they send undesirables. In Drakenhold, the king was killed by the big bad evil army and the main character wants to go help the king's son retake his rightful kingdom. In doing so, Drakenhold will pledge their support. 
Elheim is the land of the elves, including the dark elves, which live underground. The land is a magical forest with a massive tree that provides the elves their magic. The big bad evil army has marched on the elven lands and taken over and also threatens to burn the place down. Pistorius is to the north and is a vast frozen tundra. The land belongs to the Bestrals. This is where you'll recruit the were creatures into your army. The big bad evil army stationed here has discovered an artifact that causes Bestrals to frenzy. Within the chaos, the big bad can gain control. Albion is the land of the church and angels. This land has my favorite subplot. The big bad has infiltrated the church and has taken over the leadership. I won't get into how, but this part of the game has the best writing, dialogue, and story in my opinion. There are a lot of characters in Unicorn Overlord. By the time I rolled the credits, I had a team just shy of 50 characters, and I'm certain I missed some. Plenty of knights, bandits, were creatures, angels, dragon riders, griffin riders, every single one of them a potential husbando or waifu, and all of them voiced. I'm not going to go through the entire cast, that would take forever, but I do want to mention a few of my favorites. Early on, you're introduced to your childhood friend Lex. Lex is a screw-up, like hilariously so. He fails at everything from combat, decision-making, scouting, even cooking, but Lex as a character is a treasure and is one of my favorite characters. My nickname for Lex throughout my playthrough was Magikarp because I was convinced that although he may be useless now, there will come a time where he will evolve into a powerhouse that will carry the team. He didn't, but I still used him all the way to the last boss without regret. Anyway, in order to mitigate disasters because of Lex, he is given a babysitter named Chloe. Lex is voiced by Stephen Fu, who also voiced characters in Like a Dragon, Triangle Strategy, and Fire Emblem. Chloe is voiced by Heather Gonzalez, you might recognize as Yukari Takaba in Persona 3 Reload. Osh is a hilarious character with some amazing one-liners. As per his description, Osh never got the praise he needed from his mother, who eventually passed away. Now he's desperate for recognition, so you end up with lines like this. A little praise, please. A chance to earn some praise. Not so useless now, am I? Did you see that, Mother? Osh is voiced by Damon Mills, who is also in Persona 3. Yana is a swamp witch who takes the form of a young woman, but is actually ancient and has served on the council of the previous ruler. She was even around when Joseph and Hodrick were kids. Her new form has caused her power to be dampened. This is just an excuse to have an ancient, powerful mage in your party without the issue of making content trivial. Yana is voiced by Brianna Knickerbocker, who most people probably know for her role as Rim in ReZero. Virginia is Elaine's cousin and looks exactly like his mom, the Queen. Her knights, known as the Knights of the Rose, were nearly wiped out during the events of the prologue and is currently in hiding in Dragonhold. She is voiced by one of my favorite voice actors, Elizabeth Maxwell, and she also voices Sai Nijima in Persona 5, Psycho in Like a Dragon. One of my favorite features in the game is the rapport system that I mentioned earlier. Each character has a list of characters they can build rapport with. If you use these units together in a party, they will build their relationship, which has the potential to unlock small cutscenes, which expand on the relationship between the characters and even reveal a bit of backstory about them. It should be mentioned that you do have the option to recruit generic versions of each class. You you can even customize their appearance. I do wish you could name them. I wanted to recruit units and name them after viewers in the live stream chat, but sadly you have to pick from a list of names. If I had to guess, I would say this is a place because of the online battles. And one of the biggest drawbacks to using these units is they do not have rapport with the other characters. They're just generic. The art style of this game is absolutely amazing. It has that classic JRPG anime style. The character designs are very well done with a generous amount of um, thirst. I think that the artists in this game really love women's legs because a lot of the ladies in this game just aren't wearing pants for some reason. A few of my favorite designs are the witch, which has a comically large witch hat, bat familiars, and this hypnotic hip swaying. The werewolves look so vicious with their hunched forms, ragged fur, and red eyes. Also, the kilts are pretty interesting. I'm also a fan of the dragon rider's design, and if you're one of those people that feel compelled to point out that it's not a dragon, it's a wyvern, wyverns are a type of dragon, I'm prepared to die on this hill. But... Easily my favorite design is the shaman, which when promoted becomes a druid. After being promoted to druid, they stand up straight and they're covered in tattoos. They also have this more imposing looking skull helmet. It's unfortunate that the named shaman you find in the game named Selvi doesn't have this helmet because you know, you have to be able to see her expression. Still an awesome character, but after seeing other shaman in the game, I just found myself really wishing she would put the helmet back on. The music in Unicorn Overlord is this orchestral style. Hitoshi Sakamoto is credited as the producer. He composed the music for Ogre Battle and Final Fantasy Tactics, and then went on to create his own studio, Base Escape, which is the very studio that did the music for Unicorn Overlord. Mitsuhiro Kaneda is credited as the music director. He did work on Tactics Ogre Reborn. Probably the most notable credit, other than the producer, Sakamoto, is 
Yoshimi Kudo, who worked on the little known title known as Elden Ring. You'll hear his work in the Lich Dragon Fortisax boss fight. I think my favorite piece from the game itself, though, is close to the end of the game. Unfortunately, the entire Unicorn Overlord soundtrack was removed from Spotify for reasons I can't even imagine. To wrap things up, I want to talk about recommendations. Basically, games that if you like to play these, you'll like Unicorn Overlord, and vice versa. If you like Unicorn Overlord, you might like these. I never see reviewers do this or anybody that covers video games kind of like consolidate games that if you like these, you should play these other ones. I haven't seen that. I thought that would be pretty cool. The first one, Tactics Ogre Reborn, easily. I've put a lot of hours into this game and I can tell you the art style, the music, the overall vibe, the story, definitely right there with Unicorn Overlord. Final Fantasy Tactics, same thing. The problem is you can't find Final Fantasy Tactics on PC. It's gotta be mobile or, you know, PlayStation Emulator, PlayStation 1. There's also the Fire Emblem and Triangle Strategy games. I, I have a hard time recommending these two because I haven't played all of them. I haven't played all the Fire Emblem and I haven't played Triangle Strategy, but I know enough about the games that I feel comfortable recommending them based off of the other ones, but know that I haven't played them. Darkest Dungeon, which is definitely different than the other recommendations I made, but it's very similar in the combat, except that you actually get to control the units, as I mentioned earlier in the video. And... It's a lot darker themes and adult themes, so keep that in mind. I'm also going to throw Disgaea 5 in there in my recommendations. It's pretty far from Unicorn Overlord, but it does have the, the same style as some of the previous games that I mentioned. It's anime, it's over the top, tons of hours of content, great game, and I think you would enjoy it if you enjoyed any of the other games I just mentioned. And finally, Ogre Battle, which is another one that I haven't played and I have a hard time recommending, but people kept comparing Unicorn Overlord to ogre battle saying that they're very similar so i'm gonna throw it out there as something to try maybe i'll try it in the future as well let me know in the comments thank you for watching i hope you enjoyed it i hope this was informative and i just want to say that a lot of reviewers i get the feeling sometimes that reviewers don't actually finish the games or don't play a game enough to review it so i want for full transparency i live stream i want to live stream all the games that i review from start to finish from start to credits at the very least and that is the case with Unicorn Overlord. I did live stream the entire game that I, I played through it on Tactical. And that is available in the playlist section of my channel. If you're interested in that, it's like 85 hours, but at least it's there. I could say, hey, look, I played this game. I finished it. There you go. That's all I got. You have a good one. I'll see you at Sunday.